In 2018, I had the honor of being able to represent Christianity at the World Religions Conference, hosted by the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community of Canada at the University of Waterloo. So I have, now that I've learned how to make these recordings using PowerPoint and converting them into short videos, I've decided I'd share this presentation with you. It might be something you can enjoy on a Sunday, especially during this time period when we are all having church at home, um, or just for your pleasure or interest sometime if you'd like to listen to it. Hopefully it's not too dull, and uh, I will proceed with the presentation. I called this presentation A Christian Guide to Experiencing God in Today's World. Uh, that was the theme of the conference, Experiencing God in Today's World, and every speaker from each of the faith groups represented talked on that topic. But as I said to the people in attendance, this presentation won't tell you everything. It's not even close, and truthfully, it can't be more than a Christian's guide because, you know, there are nearly 2.5 billion Christians in the world, and I had not had the opportunity to speak with all of them, and still haven't. So, what I will do in this presentation is give you some very basic information about just three things. First, what experiencing God can mean. Second, how Christians, generally speaking, do it. And third, why we do it. So first, what is it to experience God? In practical terms, experiencing God can mean at least two things, or rather, a range of things on a spectrum between these two. First, the obvious but unusual one, meeting God face to face. Not many people have done this. I mean, Moses did, maybe Enoch, potentially Elijah, after the chariot ride. Well, maybe it's primarily a Jewish thing. The apostles and others met God in the form of Jesus Christ, and a few of them got to witness his glory more perfectly on what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. St. Paul and St. Stephen each had their visions, but for most of us, that sort of direct, full-disclosure kind of revelation is unlikely. On the other end of the spectrum is just believing in him, having a conviction, a sense of confidence, a will to faith in the things we're taught or that we read in the scriptures. Hannah Whitehall Smith, a 19th century lay minister of the Holiness Movement, wrote in her book, The God of All Comfort, that people who worry about whether they can know God without having some personal spiritual experience have got the wrong idea of what knowing God is or means. She wrote, Revelations are delightful when you can have them, but they're not always at your command and they're often variable and uncertain. The kind of knowing I mean is just plain, matter-of-fact knowledge of God's nature and character that comes to us by believing what's revealed in the Bible concerning him. Although this may seem very dry and bare to start with, it will, if steadfastly persevered in, result in very blessed inward revelations. Most Christians, at least at the start, are in that position of just believing. But as we proceed, as we persevere in the faith, Miss Smith promises us that there's something more. Now, I don't know the statistics, but I suspect that some degree of that something more is in fact quite common. My experience tells me that experiences of God's presence can occur on a reasonably regular basis, dependent, of course, on the individual's attentiveness and frame of mind. An example of what a lot of Christians commonly experience as an expression of God's presence is shared in the Bible. After Jesus' death and resurrection, he appeared to many of his followers. Two of these were a couple of disciples walking along the road to Emmaus, when Jesus happened along. Somehow he hid from them who he was, so they innocently carried on their conversation with him, believing they were teaching something to him about Jesus Christ. Jesus kindly obliged their desire to keep company with him, and then he taught them about himself. They were enjoying the conversation, so they invited him to dinner with them. This is when Jesus revealed himself to them. He broke bread and blessed it, as he had done at the Last Supper, and then he disappeared. The astonished disciples, interestingly enough, didn't take his actions in breaking and blessing bread, or even his sudden disappearance as the best evidence of who he was. Instead, they reflected, didn't our hearts burn within us as he spoke? A burning feeling in your heart, a washing over you of energy, a stronger sense of conviction, a feeling of elation or of comfort or peace, 
These are among the many ways that Christians experience God day to day and have the assurance of his presence and interest in our lives. So, how do we get those kinds of experience? How to get in a position where we can have an experience of God like that, or something similar, or something more? Well, first, as Hannah Whitehall Smith suggested, we just persevere in faith. We can call this connection through commitment. Commitment means staying the course, even when challenges arise. It means remaining focused and forward-moving, even when we're not absolutely sure we're getting anywhere. Just believe, Miss Smith says, and you'll get there. But steadfast perseverance, clinging together against the dark, as the philosopher Richard Rorty put it, isn't all that Christians do. We also go seeking the light. I will describe just three general categories of ways that Christians do that seeking, and finding of God, each of which corresponds to my own experience and knowledge, through creation, through contemplation, and through community. And then I will talk briefly about communion. When Karl Boberg wrote the popular Christian hymn, How Great Thou Art, it was based on inspiration he felt during and after a walk home from church. He had passed rolling meadows and fields, witnessed a powerful rainstorm, and the beautiful rainbow that followed it. He heard birds singing and a church bell ringing, and he ended up writing, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made, thy power throughout the universe displayed, then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Many Christians find opportunities in the natural world that God created to feel closer to that Creator. For some, this is not just a matter of imaginative reflection or inspiration, but a source of genuine connection. According to Kathleen Danen, the great 20th century monk Thomas Merton, quote, spent his whole monastic life listening for that sacred pulsating in the heartbeat of creation, close quote. He heard it. He said, God speaks to us gently in 10,000 things, and that, sitting in the forest, he listened for a good long while to God. You should read some of Thomas Merton's writings. There's a man that truly connected with God through his creation. He also employed the practice of contemplation. Now, I believe pretty much all religions, and even humanists, have traditions of contemplation. Christians certainly didn't invent the idea, but we do like it. Contemplation can bring us beautiful, private moments with God. It can facilitate personal insights and even revelation. Father Matael Meskin, in his book Orthodox Prayer Life, The Interior Way, describes contemplation as, quote, the soul's inward vision and the heart's simple repose in God, close quote. Robert Villardi, who wrote The Heart of Narnia and Conversations with C.S. Lewis, says Christian contemplation is about uncluttering our minds and giving what he calls space for holy reflection, sensitizing the soul to God's calling and giving God room to grow in our lives. Christians engage in contemplation in different ways. It can be experienced through focused reading and pondering of scriptures, thoughtful prayer, attentive participation in rituals like the Catholic Rosary or a sacrament such as the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, which is practiced in most Christian churches. Or it can be done through more traditional contemplative activities such as meditation, or simply but purposefully sitting in silent solitude. These are ways in which we can escape the distractions of a tumultuous world and may hear what for Elijah was described as God's still, small voice. But you know, despite all that, hanging out in the woods or meditating in a closet can be lonely activities. And as you know, God didn't make just you, and he didn't make just me. He made us. And us is another place that we can seek and find God. Us can mean just you and me doing stuff together. It can mean a family. It can mean a church community. Us is people being together. And in particular, it's people doing together. In the Christian sense, it's typically people doing good in union with one another. My friend Gordon Green, who wrote Papa Luna, Benedict the Thirteenth, and the Schism, 
shared a story about before he was a professor and dean of music at Wilfrid Laurier University when he had his first major experience in a choral music group. As everyone sang their parts and voices blended, creating stirring and uplifting melodies and harmonies, he said he had a sudden epiphany. This is not an experience you can have on your own. Love is also not an experience you can have on your own, neither are charity, service, or kindness. These are all examples of uplifting, exalting experiences for which it always takes at least two to tango. Jesus said, Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I. Now, I'm not talking about the shared ecstasy of vibrant praise and singing, or the mood that hits the room when a truly talented preacher starts to speak. While God's Spirit might attend those experiences, they can also be entirely human experiences that masquerade as spiritual. More certain are the feelings like those St. Paul described to the Galatians, love, joy, as well as connectivity, comfort, and peace, that attend people who live, work, pray, and serve together for a common good cause, particularly when the cause is oriented around service or charity. In that context, we not only get to feel God's pleasure with our good works, but we begin to know better his personality. As the Apostle John wrote, Let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now there's so much more to all this. I haven't told you about recognizing answers to prayers or how we seek solutions to difficult problems by discerning signs that God sets up in our lives. I haven't mentioned dreams and waking inspiration or how God sometimes speaks to us in whole sentences, occasionally even with what seems to be an audible voice, though it's generally just happening in our heads and hearts. I haven't discussed the role of rational thought of reasoning together as God invites us to do, and I haven't mentioned gifts of the Spirit and miracles. They happen. And I haven't shared any details with you about my own experiences with all these things. I will only tell you that everything I've shared today comes from or relates to my own experience. But something more important to tell you is what all these things are for, which brings me to the most complete experience of them all, communion. I don't mean the ritual experience called communion, and I don't mean mere communication with God, although that's part of it. What I mean by communion is the undiluted, direct, and transforming experience of God in our lives. This communion can be the completion of conversion. This is what Christians are called to, and why we are called to seek connection with God. Jesus came into the world to save the world. He lived and died and returned again to redeem, reclaim, and reform us, so that we might be reborn and have life more abundantly. Man was first made in God's image. As Bishop Tom Wright reflects in his book Following Jesus, we mess that up. Jesus fixed it. Our job now is to live the kind of life he won that victory for. When we truly accept Jesus as our Savior, He changes us and enables us to do this. Now this change can seem minor at first, and that's why we continue seeking him. As my friend Sandy Milne said at one of our Interfaith Grand River meetings, conversion, reconciliation, and transformation are ongoing. And I would add, the ultimate goal of these is that it is no longer we that live these lives, but Christ who lives in and through us. Watchman Nee put this so clearly in his book, Not I But Christ. He said, Now I declare that I am a crucified person. If I am alive today, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. This is the way of victory. This is what Paul has shown us. This is how he lives the Christian life. What is the Christian life? Only this, that it is no longer I who live, but I let Christ live for me. Jesus, Savior, pilot me, says another famous Christian hymn. This is what we are looking for. When Christians seek God, it is not merely to know him in a detached intellectual sense. It's not to satisfy curiosity. It is to become him, or rather, to let him be through us. Therefore, C.S. Lewis, in his book of essays, Mere Christianity, writes, The Christian way is different than merely seeking to be good. Christ says, 
give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I've not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think innocent, as well as the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. This is the final and lasting Christian experience of God, and this is the purpose for which we follow him by whose grace and goodness all this can be done. Thank you. That was the end of my presentation. I hope that this message has been beneficial for you in some way, not boring, but interesting, and hopefully a little uplifting. Have a wonderful day.